Hello everyone, today we briefly resume the French government of Edward II of England in one of the pre-100 uh, years war, in fact more turbulent moment uh, after the loss of uh, most of the Angevin held territories in fact in, in the continent at the hands of the French crown this is technically a video about medieval France, but of course there is a lot of English history intertwined in order to, to get it. Uh, I've never made a video about Edward II, um, as, as probably as King of England, nor for the original series, nor in, in other, um, say, English history ones. I talk extensively about Edward I. We have already encountered uh, Edward II's mother, Eleanor of Castile, that is connected importantly with the, the same French possessions of her son because she was the Countess of Pontieu, suo jure, meaning in her own right uh, in northern France. We will see this um, better in a while, but naturally the most important chunk right, of um, Edward's possessions uh, stemmed from his father's um, Angevin right on some parts of France that uh, were held um, still of course in fief uh, to the King of France but with some ambiguity uh, regarding the, the the connection especially the Angevin con um, subjection to, to the to the French crown as far as these fiefs were concerned so Edward lived between 1284 and 1327 he was the fourth son of Edward the first King of England, Lord of Ireland, and ruler of Gascony in southwestern France, right, which he held as such as a feudal vassal of the King of France. I made a video specifically about Gascony as a region. Um, here we're talking actually about a wider, um, a wider area. Speaking of Eleanor um, uh, and Edward II's mother, thus. Um, it's it's important to understand the, the ancestral connections with both England and France because she was named after her paternal great grandmother, that was none less than Eleanor of England, so the daughter of Eleanor of Aquitaine and Henry the Second of England. Um, Eleanor actively supported Edward's interests during her life. We've seen her following her husband um, in, in the Holy Land. She sucked off the poison of the um, Ashashin's, um, in fact, attempt to, to life of his um, uh, husband's uh, body. And um, she imported archers from her mother's county of Pontieu in France uh, to to help her husband in his uh, royal uh, and, and international endeavors. So, uh, an interesting figure, by the way. At some point, we'll come back on Edward the First, as we haven't actually finished. We, we talk about the, his, say, government is mostly the, the Crusade and also the conquest of Wales. But um, we will, in fact, not talk about this specifically today. So, King Edward the First of England gave up control of Aquitaine to his son um, before, shortly before his death. The future Edward II thus inherited this broader area that we, we call Aquitaine um, that was originally just a duchy but it um, in, in, southwest, in a much broader southwestern part a region of France that in fact being hegemonized by the Aquitanian dukes politically that being made up of many different um, possessions can be approximated here as Aquitaine as a wall, right? It's vast possessions south on the left bank of the river Loire, uh, constituting also one of the most uh, flourishing um, territories in Europe, especially during the, the 12th um, century. The 13th was mostly one of um, collapse of what had been the broader Angevin uh, dynastic possessions of this broader territories, uh, the the Angevin dynasty of Henry II, who married Eleanor uh, of Aquitaine, the heiress of, of the Aquitanian duke, uh, and who had been um, as already queen of France uh, before marrying uh, Henry. We, we she divorced from Louis the Seventh. She was the mother of uh, Richard Lionheart of John. Uh, of England, you know all the story, right? So, um, when we look at this 
part of, say, following essentially the 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 Carpathian takeover of most of France, we realized that this part of these southwestern territories had still been held by the Angevins, who had lost otherwise most of all what had been Normandy, like in the, the ancestral territories of the fact of the Norman house of England had been succeeded by the Angevins who had inherited um, its titles, etc. And again, just for this um, territory in the southwest, uh, you um, you have a continuity, right, of relations with the king of France. These were not particularly large assets, to, at least in, in order to to threaten the uh, the stability of the French crown. The Capetians, as you know, had basically taken over most of southern France uh, as well, and were by far more powerful than than the English um, at, at this point. But they were also pretty Leviathanic in their system that had, in fact, some important inclinations towards, especially this period, like, um, say, prefiguring the, the, the 14th century crisis. And so the English that had a, a smaller but more monk, more compact domain were looking forward to sort of re-intervene, um, of course, in, in the continent. There had been a moment of uh, Anglicization and Britannization, if, if you want, especially uh, under Henry III, um, Edward I, but there were big deals uh, occurring also in, in the war with Scotland that the English had uh, directly invaded and um, the French had instead been uh, supporting against um, uh, against the, the Plantagenets. So that's the also the, the tense background in the Franco-English relations uh, here. Um, so this procedure of bequeathing territories to your your son as a king um, was, was normal to an extent the, the, normally these rulers had given to their favorite um, the lordship of Ireland this had been a thing just to practice um, a bit of government so it was a part of a, of a broader um, curriculum right and courses on arm Edward gets uh, uh, this broader Aquitanian uh, lordship in 1306, right? And after his father's passing the following year, he inherited not only the English throne, but also the long-standing feud that we just hinted at between the Plantagenets and the French kings over the Angevin French territories. Uh, This... um, feud, as you understand, was mostly dynastic in nature. There was some, of course, provincial, um, let's say, uh, autonomistic uh, ambition from the side, especially southwestern France, that compared to the north was technically not even French. Um, These were Occitanians, they gravitated around mostly at this point, of course, the northern French orbit, but they had um, important ties with, with other areas and they had always maintained an important autonomy because that doesn't matter how powerful the Capetians really were um, these were some of the most distant territories that the French crown controlled within it uh, the the broader kingdom's uh, heartland right so that's where after all for also reasons of 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 peaceful relations, the the Capetians, that had otherwise fought against uh, the English, also in Henry III's time, in Edwards, and over the same southwestern uh, France. We, in fact, we will talk about this, about Edward I. We're all some prodromes to that. Today we don't talk about that, but mostly just what, what happened under Edward II, but mm, it was not the first time that there had been uh, a war um, over those territories uh, between the, the two, uh, the two contenders, right? So everything got down also to the uh, to the Andrewin pride in terms of what degree of subjection was to be accepted um, from their side to the French crown, uh, and of course, of course, what um, degree also of territorial control the Angevins had to facilitate the French crown, like we will see that this actually triggered um, in part the war of Saint-Sartos, that was the major 
uh, clash during Edward's uh, reign, right? And this tension was really engulfing a bit like the entire Western Europe because, of course, England and France were the major feudal monarchies um, in, 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 the, in the West and they, they, their relation, of course, heavily influenced, as we've seen recently just talking about Western commerce, right, uh, trade, um, finance, etc. The you know important assets also uh, elsewhere. Of course, there were uh, external agents fueling this conflict. Also, in fact, for reasons of uh, uh, competition and, and other um, very say, subjective interests for, for that matter. This would be exploited by the contenders as well. And in order to achieve peace, the same Pope Boniface VIII arranged a marriage between Edward II and Isabella, that was the daughter of King Philip IV of France. Um, this betrothal was particularly relevant for a number of reasons. First of all, Boniface VIII and Philip IV had lots of things going on in terms of mutual support and conflict against one another uh, at the same time. Um, there was, um, I made some videos about this topic, like not just the imperial nature of, of the French monarchy, but probably Caesar of Papism and how far um, did the, the Pope and the King of France go at this point of collapse of, of the Germanic Empire to claim actually imperial authority over the West, uh, which um, actually was not that far from the de facto reality, given that the French papal and say Capetian Angevin, not uh, English Angevin axis, was essentially and by far the most advanced uh, one in Europe in terms of state building, bureaucracy, financial wealth, um, armed forces, uh, and beyond. But as far as northwestern Europe was concerned, of course, the the, the landmass of, of the Kingdom of England and its ruling. Uh, dynasties um, rights in, in France were a quite thorny topic and something in fact that could engulf and would engulf in the 14th century in fact the, the entire kingdom together with lots of other problems also the, the, the sunset of these broader universalistic ambitions because the system at the end of the day uh, collapsed um, in, a, in a way or another right um, a potential French marriage had already been suggested for the younger Edward as a means of establishing a lasting peace with France. However, war had uh, erupted under his father, Edward I, in 1294, causing this plan to be at least temporarily abandoned. And in its place, um, the, a marriage to a daughter of Guy, Count of Flanders, uh, was proposed. But um, this arrangement was also thwarted by King Philip IV of France, and if you have an idea, you know the the various um, reasons that brought to the Hundred Years' War there was the um, growing English interest in the Count of Flanders. That was, as we've seen in multiple videos, of course part of the Kingdom of France, uh, and at this point uh, had uh, become essentially the the, the major. Um, objective of direct um, conquest of the same Philip IV that had a very hieratic and sort of, you know, divinely, in fact, universally inspired sense of the French monarchy. He had bailed out from Philip III's um, disaster uh, against Catalonia and had headed towards the diametrically opposed um, territory belonging to, to the French uh, kingdom that was Flanders, that was much closer at hand in the northeast of Paris, uh, was, as you know, the sea of important uh, textile production of the, the rich um, uh, towns that had, from multiple generations, uh, essentially escaped a bit the centripetal orbit of. Uh, the French crown's uh, consolidation, uh, even to to the point of de deteriorating the the same feudal order, right? And uh, Philip the Fourth would invade, 
uh, Flanders, the, this led to actually the French disaster of Courtrai, Courtrai that, however, didn't prevent the French to to win the war and to reaffirm a stronger um, comital power that the same Dampierre dynasty actually had taken up arms uh, uh, supporting the, the the actual rebels that had been the had um, you know literally marched with their armies the, the Flemish towns uh, against uh, the the flower of, of uh, European knighthood even scoring that major uh, uh, victory of of the of the golden spores um, in 1302 and the the main interest of the english was connected with the traditional wool uh, export of, of the country into flanders that would eventually refine would work this text um, producing textiles we're exporting also in the french system uh, and of course, the dynastic ties between France and England, in this sense, were a way to sort of um, branching further back, uh, back and further actually, into France from from the English side, exploiting the times of trouble that the French monarchy had uh, around these years. I made a video explaining what happened essentially from the reign of Philip the Fourth to the the, fer the first decades afterwards. Lots of uh, of crisis, of scandals, of financial um, turbulence, and also rapid su succession of kings, as we will see now, that mostly occurred, in fact, under Edward, uh, contemporary to Edward II's uh, English reign. The um, betrothal between Edward and Isabella took place in 1308, um, when the... Uh, king proceeded with his marriage to the French princess. Uh, just a banal thing, you know, if you have watched Braveheart, like, the entire story is about, you know, Edward's uh, sort of... Uh, there, there are a lot of inconsistencies in the chronology, etc. Edward's, um, you know, pushed homosexuality and uh, Sophie Marceau playing, actually, the rebellious sort of pr proud... Uh, uh, French uh, princess and English queen at this point. And there are lots of, um, you know, actually the, the picture is much more complex and, and interesting, and we will partly address this with uh, Mortimer's Rebellion, etc. Um, the, the, the marriage took place in, in France, right? Edward traveled um, there in January, 1308, he left his favorite, uh, Gavestone, in charge of the kingdom. This was carried out um, with, you know, this guy was hated because he was, in fact, Edward's favorite. There were also the, all the, the voices about the, um, the homosexuality, the, uh, uh, the, the love for this man. Um, it's also a more complex thing. It's inherent in the contrast between the barons uh, and the monarchy. That the fact, of course, that uh, England had received a pretty heavy blow from you know, the, the Magna Carta and the following constitutions limiting monarchic government, but you know it had still a great potential as a cohesive state, and this would be particularly evident uh, under Edward's son, Edward III, that sort of uh, carried out a repulsity of his father's say times. Um, uh, court, but also those who had taken him out to, to an extent, we will see it uh, in the end. Um, and um, this gavestone had been given by Edward with an unprecedented amount of power, right? He had uh, produced properly a, uh, an especially in great, great seal to which gavestone had to rule in his absence. Evidently, Traveling over to France was a way, as we will see now, to also, uh, you know, for, for for the French crown to assert further power and influence over what was here the the English king that was coming to to marry not, not just as a French vassal, right? So um, the uh, the the king's daughter. So this was particularly uh, relevant. By the way. Edward and Philip did not like each other at all, right? Um, Edward uh, likely hoped that his marriage would improve his position in Gascony, 
because that was effectively the only territory that was uh, governed by him, albeit in a decentralized way. This was quite a concern for Edward that due to the domestic opposition he met uh, in England needed money, right? needed funds. So it was not much about Gascony uh, you be having to be used as I don't know, a bridge hand for an invasion of France. It was about getting more money to quell the discontent uh, in England. The final negotiations for the marriage that were technically to still take place, in fact, between Edward and Philip, were difficult. Uh, as we said just here, that the two had a strained uh, relationship. The French king drew a hard bargain because of it um, over the size of Isabella's dower and the administration of Edward's lands in France accordingly. As part of the final agreement, Edward paid homage to Philip for the Duchy of Aquitaine and agreed to a commission to implement the 1303 uh, Treaty of Paris. Right, The Treaty of Paris had concluded the Anglo-French War of 1294-1303, had been signed back uh, in the day by Philip and Edward I, according to the terms of the treaty Gascony was returned to England from France or better recognized in the uh, in the right of, of the Angevin ruler um, after that Philip had actually forfeited it um, had be, had probably cancelled Edward's rights um, and uh, occupied actually the same territory during the war right um, and uh, in fact much of this sort of back and forth can be seen as laying the, the ground for the Hundred Years' War as this, um, you know, say greater French power was not, however, enough to fully dislodge the uh, English presence there, right? This aspect is quite fascinating because it was a, a big deal of naval interconnection between England and places like Bordeaux uh, I explained this in the videos about the Duchy of Aquitaine, the medieval Aquitaine and say southwestern France as a wall. Um, and uh, it, it was sort of easy to make leverage on these towns that um, had were, were connected with this outer trade uh, via sea and so sort of escaped a bit centrifugally from 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 the center of a French crowd that was also pretty uh, pretty far away. Additionally, it was reaffirmed in the same treaty of 1303 that Philip's daughter would wed Edward's son, which technically hadn't even been the first time that such an idea had been even written down, contemplated. This had been arranged since the Treaty of Montreuil of 1299, right? So it was obviously in the air because you understand that say, fostering. The, the, the Capetians were very prolific. They had this enormous clan that uh, was uh, biologically stronger, right, in terms of, you know, um, magnetic attraction, like just as a center of gravity of all the various, again, marriages in, in Europe, um, etc. So, uh, but they, the English, of course, dreamt of getting uh, rights of their own, uh, at least uh, in addition to the ones that they already would contemplate, especially from Edward III's onwards, to some legitimate basis, depending whether you accept it or not, female inheritance. And um, and that, however, uh, could uh, be fostered through these, uh, these unions. Uh, now, disputes arose over appeals from Edward's Gascon subjects to the Parliament of Paris, and the French crown's demands for homage, which were worsened by the frequent changes in the French leadership during Edward's reign. So the homage thing had been quite important in 1308 because this was probably a um, a man-to-man -man bond, 
right? The, the, the concept of the, the feudal homage was entailing this ceremony in which the feudal tenant or vassal pledged reverence and submission to his feudal lord, right? So in this way, Edward had sort of bowed to a higher power, even in the vest of English king, and this, in exchange, as we've seen for um, the symbolic title to his new uh, new position, uh, that is the, the investiture. This is also fascinating that these rights were not simply recognized as something ancestrally Plantagenet, but you know were sort of reestablished, reconfirmed, or uh, given new validity and uh, formal um, you know uh, formal acceptance by the guy that at least was objectively, yes, the feudal lord, as, as far as those were French fiefs, right? But this had also, again, to do with literally uh, a king of England marrying the uh, French king's daughter. Needless to say, the French support of Scotland against Edward uh, in the same years was not really helpful, right? Um, again, the the French were, first of all, Philip did not like Edward, uh, but there was a much broader interest, of course, in this anti-English, say, affairs, because, of course, the, the, the more engulfed England would have been, and the, the easier, at least to some extent, the, uh, also the, the, the French, uh, the more easily the French authority could be extended in some, some parts of the French territory. Actually, Louis IX, Philip's grandfather, had decided to back England in some of the most difficult times of Henry III's, in fact, um, Edward II's uh, grandfather, in turn, reign in, in the struggles against the barons. So, of course, there was some stability to be pursued um, with, um, I mean, through the the, the same strengthening of the English market to some extent, as long, however, it did not expand territorially. And of course, what had happened with Scotland, that we will see in some thorough detail, hopefully soon, had sort of um, um, disturbed the, the French that were supporting, um, in fact, the English enemies. Um, although official mediation efforts such as the process of Perigreux and 30, in 1311 had little success, Edward's personal attempts, such as his visit to Paris to pay homage uh, again in 1313, helped to alleviate some of these issues. This was seen, of course, as a display of weakness um, uh, by the, uh, the English barons, uh, against a king that, again, had quite some strained relations at this time with them. These troubles would break out in, in open warfare and uh, would also bring Edward's reign to an end, as we will see later. However, the sovereign knew his deal, like he was objectively succeeding in consolidating his uh, his rights in, in France through the, the recognition of French in, in, in spite of all the attritions that existed with this as well, right? Um, they were not serene relations. Uh, the conflicting roles of Edward as an independent monarch and uh, a, ba a vassal of the French king led to ongoing tensions. And that's where the War of saint Sartos came into play. Uh, the French monarchy had been having troubles on its own, as we uh, said before, uh, other different um, rulers had succeeded for dynastic reasons um, on the, the throne of France in the sense had remained a bit you know deprived of a continuous uh, government after Philip IV we have Louis X and John I, Philip V finally Charles IV who was also Isabella's daughter right and this guy had an even less compromising attitude than his predecessors in 1323, Charles demanded that Edward come to Paris to pay homage, customary for Gascony, insisting that Edward's administrators in the province follow orders given by the French crown. 
Tensions escalated with one of Edward's vassals in Gascony violently resisted French uh, attempts to build a royal bastide near the priory of Sardos in the Agenais. Edward denied responsibilities, but the relation between the two sovereigns deteriorated. This, along with Edward's failure to pay homage to King Charles IV of France since his accession in 1322, prompted the latter to declare Edward's lands forfeit in 1324. Edward tried to resolve the conflict by sending the Earl of Pembroke to Paris, but the Earl died on the way. So some sort of divine sanction on this attempt. Charles then mobilized his army and invaded Gascony. Although Edward had 4,400 troops in the province, the French, led by Charles of Valois himself, had 7,000 soldiers. Valois took control of the Agenais and besieged Bordeaux, the most important city in, in Gascony, resulting in Edward losing most of his territory in the province and leaving him with just a narrow coastal strip from uh, Bordeaux to Bayonne. This course of actions was kind of obvious because the French had the, the upstream advantage, but of course they had to approach the um, coastal cities, the, the, they had to reach the Atlantic from which the English uh, could keep uh, supplying the, the besieged uh, fortresses. Uh, in retaliation, Edward arrested French individuals in England and seized Isabella's own lands. We will see now what the Queen had been up to. In November 1324, Edward met with the Earls and the English Church, who advised him to send 11,000 men to Gascony. Edward chose not to go himself, but sent in his stead the Earl of Surrey. He also engaged in negotiations with the French king, uh, obviously constantly, of course, every communication channel was open. Um, Charles proposed that if Isabella and Prince Edward were to travel to Paris for the prince to give homage for Gascony, he would end the war and return even the Agenais. So you understand how important this, uh, this was. It was about backing down. It was about showing that the French were the strongest and that the English would have had just to be obedient. Edward was, in fact, hesitant to send the the, the prince, um, but agreed to send Isabella alone as uh, the, the ambassadrix in March 1325. Right, and uh, Edward expected Isabella and their son to return to England, but she would remain in France, signaling actually the deterioration of their marriage that had been actually successful until 1322. There hadn't been major strains. Um, but things had been going on. First of all, there had been the Despenser's Wars. Um, in the same year, um, the old opposition uh, to Edward, consisting of the Marcher Lords um, Associates, um, brought to an escalation, same, had brought the same escalation in England. Um, we haven't seen this, but essentially, Edward managed to capture the leader, the Earl of the Mark, Roger Mortimer, who was held prisoner in Wallingford Castle. Um, this was uh, quite a, you know, at least, um, at least one of the most prominent of the imprisoned among, among the others. Had been battles, again, open clashes. And Mortimer managed to escape from the Tower of London and fling to France. He had been previously condemned to death, but the penalty had been transmuted by the king to life uh, in prison. Now, the connection with the queen is quite uh, intense uh, and dramatic. Uh, in fact, uh, Isabella had, uh, after the war uh, in, in England, eager to escape from her husband, apparently. She received his own consent to travel to France to, as we've seen, use her influence with her brother during the uh, war in, um, in, um, in Aquitaine with King uh, Charles IV 
to advocate for peace. And during her time at the French court, Isabella became involved with the same Mortimer that had uh, basically sought and obtained French protection. And so the two became later, uh, not that later actually, uh, quite uh, suddenly, uh, lovers. And this aspect is also quite punching considering you know the situation in which Edward was finding himself right and uh, this was a very dangerous business because you know there is a war in um, in Gascony that you have to finance in England you have imprisoned the leaders of just the, the discontents of the, the martyr lords the, the rebellions from the midlands and things can escalate further a head a major head of the rebels have sought protection uh, to France that is hosting them. And your own wife, the Queen of England, that is also the sister of the King of France, is basically uh, in love with your your major opponent, is basically turning um, uh, uh, towards France. Um, so you understand what the, the Spencers at home were thinking like they were just waiting for a new rebellion right and the the situation is actually more complicated um, because the same Mortimer at a point wanted uh, Isabella to come back to England right so that at least the um, uh, the the end uh, say the, the the plot could succeed against better against the she, she could rally the rebels against the king um, and she instead retreated to raise troops in her county of uh, Ponthieu while Mortimer arranged for an invasion fleet provided by the Hainauters because he had um, gone to over to Hainau were uh, acting as actually a protector of the English prince and heir this is the young Edward III very complicated situation, but it's not the first time um, that uh, not even in Plantagenet history, which you know the the heirs to the throne were weaponized by the rebellious barons. Mortimer was assembling an army in England with broader support and advice obtained internationally, dating back at least March 1326. By the way, the same Isabella and Mortimer had been obliged to leave the French court because of the scandal surrounding their relationship. This was very important at the time. In the French court, as we've seen, especially from the times of uh, Louis IX, you know, the Philip IV had also embodied, but even way before that, this is a contrast uh, that dated back to the times of Helena of, of Aquitaine and uh, her previous husband, Louis VII, who was extremely rich and stern. Um, pious spiritual individual um, and um, th there had been scandals um, in uh, think about the one of the two the nail in the same French court etc but the facade was the one again of actually the European Empire as France technically was at that point um, that was chosen by God with sacred blood and holy anointing it and general you know reflection of these um, in the customs in the and in power, so that's how the the way to Eno uh, in Flanders had uh, occurred. We'll talk about Eno, uh, given that we talked recently about Brabant, about Flanders in general. Um, that's where they secured assistance for an invasion of England, right, from um, the Count William of Eno. And Isabella arrived from. Ponthieu, just as the fleet was preparing to sail, and on September the 24th, 1326, they landed in the River Orwell with Prince Edward and Henry, uh, Earl of Lancaster, and London rallied in support of the Queen, leading Edward to flee westward. Uh, remember that Edward II had remained in, in England throughout all this mess. Um, pursued by Mortimer and Isabella herself. Um, and so after wandering aimlessly in Wales for s several weeks, the king was finally captured on November the 16th and compelled to abdicate in favor of his son. 
Um, and so we will see this um, when talking about Edward III, who was crowned uh, on February the 1st of the following year. The country by that point was effectively ruled by Mortimer and Isabella. On September 21st, 1327, Edward II died in captivity. There are lots of voices regarding uh, Wu. Uh, f first of all, Wu, how did he die, Raleigh and them, and uh, the fact that, um, you know, th of course the circumstances were mysterious or has led to different uh, conspiracy theories, uh, with some suggesting, in fact, that Mortimer's men were involved and or that it was Edward III's men that were pushed to do so because of Mortimer's pressure, but none of this actually has been um, demonstrated, um, uh, etc. So, the um, this is actually the end of uh, the French history of Edward II, if anything, because it's the end of Edward II's life. And, and of course, uh, there is plenty of French issues going on with Edward III, to say the least. Um, and uh, and then his son, the Black Prince, we talk about the Battle of Poitiers and more. Like you know, it, it's all a history that we have to cover in detail. We didn't never talk about Crecy. We never talked about even just about the Hundred Years' War as, as a wall. Right? I have a playlist about that, but it's mostly a collection of different, say, uh, not really side topics, but something that still is it must be agglutinated. Um, together by some more systemic structural uh, info. Uh, in other words, we have to make much more videos about that, but it, it's also important to consider that the Hundred Years' War as a sum of different wars, um, and part, of course, of the broader conflict that was dragging on for, since, you, you can argue literally ever since Rollo was settled on the lower uh, sand basin by Charles the Simple, right? So it, it's not really just about the um, the Plantagenets, but of course here we're talking about a much more in, unavoidably intricated European dimension and scale of of, of English um, French politics. So uh, this would escalate further to. Uh, a degree that, in fact, the Hundred Years' War well embodies, uh, as far as the the length, the scale, the complexity, the depth, the costs, the the destructions, were all involved, right? But and it's fascinating. I have a playlist that I created back in the day, which is titled um, "France and England Compared." I think, I, even though this video is technically not about that, but it's still about France and England in in, in many ways. So I will pair them in that way. I can maybe retitle the, the playlist in some other fashion. But um, it, it's interesting, because by the way, I would create even many more playlists, but, and I can, and I would. I'm also adding some description in very synthetic ways. I don't have the time, actually. You know that back in the day, was Farpunkt, I used to to write uh, directly like a, a description for every video every day, right, and it's become pro prohibitive, I stopped, I inserted some, the standard text that I think, I don't know when you're listening to this in the future, but um, at this currently is uh, pretty standard, like, look at all the playlists I have, whatever. But now I'm refilling uh, them with some standard, uh, actually AI, I, th I think it's useful because you give them like 4,500 characters, you tell them uh, the, what they ha the topics they have that, that are discussed. Because actually the AI is too stupid to even organize a generic like historical presentation about a country during the Middle Ages, for example. So it's totally unreliable, totally useless. Um, but it, you'd say for something so generic like a playlist, it can sort of work. And uh, that hopefully, like if I fill all the playlists, I can perhaps attract many more views from Google that apparently um, uh, is ever more used to reach a Schwerpunkt, um, interestingly enough, right? YouTube doesn't quite uh, recommend my content because it's smaller compared to the bigger channels still, but if we get extra views from there, it's going to be fine. 
Um, and the only problem, that I, I will have to signal to YouTube, of course, they will not change it for me, but it's the fact that I created so many playlists that when I upload the videos, uh, uh, here I had never showed you, but basically it tells you, look, where, in which playlist do you want to fit this? Like, I don't know how many playlists I have, I think several hundreds or something. And there is apparently a roof limit, after which, um, normally if you, there is this... Um, page that opens with all the playlists and you can if you insert I don't know E I don't know it it, it will mm, present you I don't know European history or medieval England every E that there is and it's very easy very handy to actually when you upload er, the video every day to insert it in the various playlists and I realized that the oldest ones um, be, beyond a certain threshold of um, fact of other playlists have been updated more recently because just you inserted the more recent videos in them does not appear and so basically you have to do it manually it's a waste of time and I was thinking about even reforming the playlists but I haven't lost hope that I can uh, still handle it in some way because I created I have uh, all a list of playlists that um, I want to I wanted to create as I have I have wanted to create uh, but I still haven't had the time of the interest, especially when this thing sort of um, made me understand how relatively useful that this practically is. I, w I would lose uh, playlists in this regard. But now that I think about it, it's not maybe that complicated. In any case, um, yeah, and I still have to... Well, okay, this has given me actually more confidence to, to, to see objectively that it's much less important, much less problematic than I thought. But the, the point is that there are so many playlists that, that I even forget how many there are. So sometimes it happens that I find like a playlist that doesn't have a video that I remember to fit the, the, the topic and instead, you know, it's, it's not there. So, well, I can add it, but I want it, I want the channel to be orderly and Nothing really happens. Most playlists are not really even watched, or probably they're not even that useful. But I think if I look at the stats, that there are lots of people actually that are watching the playlist, and that's something which I'm very satisfied by because um, I that these playlists are important. I think the idea that you can basically sort out whichever. That's why I make all these playlists. You, whichever interest, whichever subject you can be into, um, uh, and just watching the videos that you know pertain to that. It's not really Schwarzenegger's philosophy because the idea is that you have to watch the entirety of the videos. But now we surpassed 2,000, and there are certain topics that really look well, like selected, um, you know, compacted in various playlists uh, and playlists here I see at least looking at the stats of the last month correspond to 17.6 percent of watch length and 11.6 percent of views right the largest by far is navigational functions then YouTube search these make together more than 50% both in views and watch time right and the rest is just the sum of this mostly playlists channel pages advice videos um, they're all important and there are ups and downs but I'm confident let's say that there can be some bro profitable um, growth just based on this radical intertwinement especially now that I make these uh, importantly thematic videos I would say to to an important depth, an important extent I advise the audience to watch the others and so the idea of a connection here with um, I don't know what we talk about already, Gascony, the Hundred Years War, um, Edward the First's reign, um, French monarchy at the time and, and more and more like I, I really like um, how the, the channel is, is um, being structured like right it took time but finally we have something very like a critical mass that people like to browse and to to get into um, again that's the best thing for today however i stop it here
I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.